That's a question we've all often asked. Why did she marry him? Are our relationships and our choice of partners determined by modern romantic love? Or are there more ancient forces at work? Could evolution offer the explanation to our choice of a partner? Bus 89 was even interested in something else that would provide answers to this question. And he wondered if really men and women are looking for the same things in a partner. What do they have different agendas? Do they have different uh, reasons for choosing the type of partner that they do? To understand this, we need to, need to go back a little while. We need to go back about two million years to what is known as the environment of evolutionary adaptation. Two million years is nothing in uh, evolutionary terms. So we are pretty much the same people as we were two million years ago. And if we know what life was like then, we might understand and we might be able to make predictions about why males and females choose the types of mates that they do. So if the key point of evolution is that we're uh, aiming to pass on our genes as effectively as we can, then um, because males and females have got very different relationships to their offspring, we might expect them to behave differently in the way they choose mates. So have a look at the next one here. Let's see what you think. One man with three, three wives. Why do you think a man might choose this arrangement if he was determined to pass his genes on? And why do you think a woman might be more likely to make this choice? So if, um, if mate choices are to do with evolution, we might be able to make three uh, predictions. And these are the three predictions that Bus is actually going to uh, be investigating in the course of this research. The first prediction is to do with parental investment and sexual selection. So as parents, males and females have got very different kind of input into uh, to the, the, the birth and survival of children. Men obviously need to be involved in the sex and then it's down to the female who carries the baby. We're thinking humans, we're talking nine months of pretty hard work. Uh, the female generally feeds the newborn and so her life is quite massively affected um, in comparison to the life of the male. Now if the females want to make sure that their genes are uh, passed on and and the young survive you would think that they might be uh, very fussy about choosing a supportive partner um, people who could provide resources and food and shelter so out of these two oh sorry that's got a bit haywire so out of these two you might think that uh, this executive guy here might be more of a choice than uh, Frank Gallagher out of uh, what's that program again shameless so if males want to make sure their genes are passed on, you would predict that they would mate with as many females as possible to maximise their chances. So straight away we can see that males and females are going to be different in terms of fussiness, according to this theory. A second prediction might be to do with reproductive value and fertility. So a reproductive value is the number of women, the number of uh, offspring a woman can ha possibly have in the future. And their fertility is their current probability of having offspring now. So in other words, a woman of, of about 20 uh, might be quite near peak fertility uh, and that they, they'd be very uh, likely to have, produce children at that age. Whereas a, um, a younger girl of, say, 14 would have higher reproductive value because they've got a lot more childbearing years ahead of them. Okay. Now, uh, you would predict that males would look for females that have uh, high levels of these two qualities. All males are interested in doing and passing on their genes, so they'd be looking for fertile women or women with high reproductive values. And how do you tell that a woman has uh, got high reproductive value or fertility? You look for signs of youth. Smooth skin, muscle tone, shiny hair, full lips. But 
on the other hand, it's harder to tell a man's fertility from his appearance. So you would predict that youthful appearance would be more important to men than women. And that's one of the predictions that Bass is going to investigate. This uh, young woman here is having uh, sex triplets, by the way. Okay. Paternity probability. Here's another prediction. Okay, now if males want to pass their genes on, they want to make sure that the offspring they um, the offspring they are bringing up are their own. Um, we would predict that males, therefore, are more likely to choose women who are chaste who haven't had sex with anyone else, because that would guarantee that the, that they are the father. Women don't have to be so worried, obviously, because they know that their offspring have their genes. So you would predict then that men would show a, strong, a stronger preference for virginity in a mate than women. So what was Bus aiming to do? Bus aimed to look at mate preferences in lots of different cultures to see if there were any similar patterns across the world. And if he did find any similar patterns, that would probably be explained by evolution because they couldn't be explained by things like culture or religion because they'd be different. So, uh, a good answer on procedures would involve all three of these, uh, th these bubbles below, the ones called samples to do data collection and the actual questionnaire itself. Bus took 37 samples from 33 different countries, six continents, and five islands. Total number of participants uh, 10,047, which is probably the biggest uh, piece of research of the, of the 10 studies we've looked at. Um, the samples varied in size quite a long way, though, from 55, which is a small sample from Iran, and the largest sample was nearly 1,500, 1491 uh, in America. In the United States. Now all the samples apart from Iran were over 100 and the mean sample size was 272. The age range of participants was between 16.96 and 28.71 so, so um, a mean age of 23 years. So we'd be thinking really um, and Buss is thinking here would be that he's interested in people who are either in the process of uh, choosing a mate or are just uh, just doing so. Okay, he used a range of sampling techniques, and uh, just as the size of the, the different sizes of the samples may start you asking questions about how representative this research will be, the sampling techniques varied as well. So, for example, in Estonia, um, the sample was chosen from people who were applying for a marriage license. Uh, Venezuela was a systematic sample, uh, choosing every fifth household in a variety of neighbourhoods with different classes. In South Africa, it was an opportunity sample in uh, Zulu villages. Uh, these people couldn't read, so the questions had to be read, uh, read out to them, and the answers written down. Uh, in West Germany, it was done. It was done via newspaper adverts, so we had a volunteer sample there. Um, and then in New Zealand, again, we used opportunity sampling with our high school students. So we'll be thinking to ourselves: there, is this going, is this going to affect? Uh, is this going to affect our uh, overall results and the validity of our results? Okay. The next aspect of the procedure is data collection. That was done by residents of each country, and uh, the results were, of the questionnaire were posted to the United States. And the researchers weren't aware of the uh, of what the hypothesis was. And that's going to be a positive point when we're discussing uh, his methodology later on. Okay, now as far as translation was, was going, um, he used three translators. Think, think about this. This is, uh, this, is, this is a good strength of this research. One, so if he, if he was doing, for example, German, um, he would use one translator to tra translate from English into German, another one from German back into English, and then a third one to resolve the disagreements. Um, neutral words were used wherever he could. So rather than saying, uh, that, that's gender neutral. So rather than saying beautiful or pretty or handsome, he would use words like uh, physically attractive. Uh, he also modified 
uh, questionnaires to take account of local customs. So um, if you have a look at the differences in Sweden and Nigeria, for example, these questionnaires would have been modified to take those kind of things into account. The questionnaire itself was in two parts. Well, it collected, it collected data in two different ways. And these, the two different ways that uh, they used, but BUS calls these instruments. Okay, so there's two parts uh, of the questionnaire, and each one BUS calls an instrument. The first instrument is, um, is a rating exercise. So it was, this part of the questionnaire was split into three subsections. Uh, biographical data about the participant, age, sex, origin, those, uh, those kind of things. Uh, there were some questions about mate preferences. What age would they like to marry? What age difference would they want between them and their part uh, partner? Uh, how many children? And then they were asked to rate eight, 18 characteristics. So they had to uh, give them a mark. Uh, and there were four target variables that were involved. Good financial prospects, good looks, chastity, ambition, and industriousness. And those four are related to the hypotheses about evolutionary mate selection that we saw earlier. So it was a four point rating scale and the participant had to rate whether a characteristic was three at one level, that would be, would be indispensable, absolutely essential, or zero, meaning that it would be unimportant. And then the second in instrument was a ranking exercise. So they were given 13 characteristics of a mate and they had to rank them in order of desirability. And they say this is the most desirable characteristic and this is the least desirable ca characteristic. Now within there, there were two target variables that, that, um, that uh, Bus was interested in and they were good earning capacity. That would have been one of them. That's obviously to do with resources and the other one would be physical attractiveness. So looking at those two, you might think which one would BUS expect uh, women to show a preference for and which one would uh, men show a preference for according to BUS and his evolutionary hypothesis. Okay. Okay, that's where I'm going to leave this Prezi. I'm going to uh, this uh, screencast I'm going to do another one now. It's going to be called Bus Part 2 of some sort. Uh, and we'll go from uh, findings and conclusions and work our way through uh, to the method, evaluation of methodology and alternative evidence. Okay. It would be really useful for me if you made a note of uh, any questions or anything that you don't find clear. Um, and it would be useful for you too. So you can bring those to um, a lesson and discuss that with one of your teachers. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you later.